<laughs> there we go. Okay, and so, um, yeah, we're so grateful that you all are here and Julia is gonna share a little bit about her practice. <laughs> oh no, it's going through everything. Hold on. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Julia Vidger Ned Bornink. I'm a visiting artist from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and yeah, I'm an alt process photographer. I worked in the dark room. I worked digitally, um, but alt process is like kind of my my love. <laughs> I really enjoy um, being really hands on with all my techniques, and yeah, just like getting my hands dirty and making stuff. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna talk about my practice from the very beginning, which was in high school was when I started. I was very lucky to go to a high school that had a dark room and was very um, arts focused. Um, so I kind of have this first slide here showing like my progress as a printer. So um, the one on the left here, this is like one of my first prints that I made. And the one on the right is a more recent one. Um, you can see the qualities like a little bit better on the right because it's um more recent um and yeah I just want to talk about um how I came to become the photographer I am today so I was always really um experimental with my work um these are silver gelatin prints but they're solarized which is an alternative process where you basically before you develop your image you expose it to light and it kind of creates this like fluorescent like um I don't know how to explain it kind of like a really like silvery kind of look mm -hmm. um but basically I've always really loved experimenting when I first started photography in high school I tried as many different things as I could and I just kind of saw what, what I kind of did what, what stuck and yeah I've always been super experimental and I've always tried to press the boundaries of what I'm doing and I also learned alternative process in high school. These are sienna type. Um, this one on the left here has some pen and ink on it as well. I like to do mixed media as well. I've also worked with drawing and ceramics and other stuff like that. But photography is definitely what I've been, what I've worked the most with. Um, and yeah, sienna type is a really unique process in that it creates this really beautiful blue color. And I've always really been in love with the process. And it's also really easy and really fun. Julie, what is it? Yeah. It's basically um, two solutions that are, are made up of like these powders that are weird. I don't know, like ferric ammonium citrate and something else, um, <laughs> like something cyanide. I don't know. It's kind of crazy stuff. And you mix it together and then you uh, put it on your paper and then you expose it with your either a transparency or like maybe a botanical or something like that and you expose out in the sun under glass kind of like our lumen prints mm -hmm. um and you just leave it out in the sun for a few minutes and then when you when you get back you put it in water and it creates that like beautiful blue color that you see here yeah yeah if you guys have any questions feel free to just ask them so um, the one on the left there, mm -hmm. that was photographed somehow you put on the paper and the, yes. and the dark parts. Yeah, so um, I basically made a digital negative, which okay. is a, an enlargement of a negative, just like with a printer. Um, and it's when you 
when you make these, you want it to be a negative and then your result is a positive. So similar to the dark room. Um, but yeah, you can make them on with like any printer and like some transparency paper. It's pretty easy. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> so <wild>. yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. So, also in high school, I was in a program called Visions, which was in collaboration with uh, the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art. Mm -hmm. And it was basically where once a month, a group of us from our school and other schools in the Valley got to um, participate in a bunch of workshops with other artists. And it was really, really fun, um, a really great experience. <clears throat> and this was one of my pieces for my final show for my mm -hmm. senior year. And, um, <clears throat> sorry. This is a salt print, which is a different process to cyanotype, but it's similar when you take it out into the sun. Mm -hmm. um, but it creates this like beautiful brown kind of effect. And this one was with um, bougainvillea leaves. Mm -hmm. And I did some like really light embroidery on them as well. But yeah, it was just um, an example of like me doing more mixed media stuff. Um, and yeah, just experimenting, having lots of fun. I got to do this process because we had a new uh, photo teacher my senior year, and she basically got to teach us like a bunch of new stuff that I didn't get to learn before, which was really cool. Yeah. And then also in high school, <laughs> these are like kind of um, really like fun, silly. My friends and I would just go into the studio and just take really random pictures. So this was a day where we like played with a bunch of makeup and used like expired color film. Um, so that's why it looks really grainy and kind of, uh, what's the word? I don't know, it's like very low contrast. Yeah. And um, yeah, so like I, I just really wanted to like experiment, use expired stuff. Um, use stuff that other people would consider useless. I really wanted to incorporate that in my own work. <clears throat> so when I started college, I went to a community college and this is when I started doing bookmaking. And bookmaking is a really great way of showing your work without having to get it framed and matted and all that stuff, which is a really expensive process. So I did, uh, I made books because it was cheaper and it's actually quite easy. Um, so this was a book I did basically about, um, that was about like fruit and our, I don't know, it was like a really, I have some writings in here that are like kind of weird. I probably wouldn't have done it the same if I did it today. <laughs> um, this is a close up of one of the shots from the last slide. But I also took um, pomegranate seeds and I made beads out of them. And I strung them along here on the page. And I also um, had Hebrew writing for like all of my images because the pomegranate and the fruits I used are like pretty prominent within Jewish culture which I'm Jewish I was raised Jewish and um, I really wanted to find a way to incorporate that in my work and make it very authentic to me yeah and so also in college is when I finally learned lumen printing um, so these are my first lumen prints um, which is basically taking expired photo paper and a botanical and exposing it out in the sun. It's really easy, really fun. Um, and it, you get these really, really beautiful results depending on the paper you use. Um, and they 
create like this like bioluminescent effect that I've always really loved and is really unique to the process. Yes. Do you need to use expired photo paper? You don't, but it's probably recommended because you don't want to waste like good mm -hmm. photo paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. If it's expired or if it's fog, so like if it's been exposed to light, then usually you would like save it for this kind of process. This is color. Um, no, this is black and white photo paper. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So how does that process work with this glass paper? Yeah, so it's basically glass, botanical, and then the photo paper, and then you just take it out in the sun. That's it. And so that, it's like you see the grain of the, of the leaves and everything. How does that transfer to the paper? It looks like it's on the opposite side. Yeah. I mean... I think it's just the veining and stuff of the leaves get kind of imprinted, especially like the more um, the more watery or like the like the more freshly picked it is, then the like more like kind of aura and stuff you'll have and more details you'll get. Some the way the water interacts with the paper is kind of how that effect comes to light. I'm not really exactly sure how. Yeah. And so the white part is because of the two leaves were over a sound. Yeah. Like, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I also experimented with anthotypes, which is a process where you take um <clears throat> different fruit juices or spice mixes and you take a positive transparency and you take it out into the sun. And these were exposed for maybe two or three weeks. It takes a really long time. Wow. But basically, it's like sun bleaching an image with fruit juice. Hmm. So this one is, is on fabric and that one's on paper. But you get these really, really cool results. You can get lots of different colors depending on what dye you use. But basically, it's just using natural dye to create photographs. It's a really, really beautiful process. Is that, is, oh, yeah. Did you also do that with transparency? Yes. Like, yeah. But with a positive transparency instead of a negative one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it not white? Um, well, I guess because the way it's like, rather than like sienna type, it's like a positive to a negative. It's just a, whatever your image is, is like what's going to be bleached onto. It's not going to be opposite, like a sienna type would be. Yeah. So you could do it opposite, but it would be an opposite. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And this one on the left here, that's technically an opposite image. Um, because I used a negative for that one. Yeah. And this one is an anthotype. It's very, very faint, but you can see like a small silhouette um, in the middle. And I just really love this one. Anthotypes are not permanent. They do fade over time, um, which is why I like to scan them as soon as I'm done exposing them and I get a digital copy. But these images technically don't even exist anymore because mm -hmm. they faded over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is sienna type with watercolor pigment, so not another anthotype, but I was really into color and this was like one of this was like an uh, one of my alt process finals for one of my classes and uh, the series I, sp I specifically made about like gender and the body and this one was kind of exploring like different body parts and how they relate to our uh, gender expression and yeah, I've really, really enjoyed this series, and it was very intimate, and I really, really like how it came down. Yeah. <laughs> so again, I, try, I experimented with even more alternative processes. So this one on the left is gum bichromate, which is similar to anthotype, and you get lots of different colors, but also it's um, you kind of do it layer by layer. So typically you would do it cyan, magenta, and yellow, like the, and then black. So like the four colors that make up most images like on computers and in screen printing and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, this one wasn't perfect. It is really hard to get the right um, consistency between each uh, layer, but this is basically three layers, four layers, um, all and to make that one image, like a full color image. Yeah.
And then the one on the right here is just a Sienna type that was on fabric, but I used some bleach on it. Mm -hmm. um, so you can also bleach and tone uh, your Sienna types with like tea, with bleach, like all kinds of other pigments and stuff like that to create like really cool effects on your mm -hmm. prints. Yeah. <clears throat> did you did you decide to bleach it because the edges of the transparency were so hard or had you like been intending for it I was just kind of experimenting and I had this photograph that I wasn't really a huge fan of when it was just the sienna type mm -hmm. um it just felt kind of simple to me so I added the bleach around it to kind of make my subject pop out a little bit more mm -hmm. um and it created like this nice really cool like looking That's border really yeah so this was another book I made. Um, I made this one about failure because <laughs> I was really struggling making prints in the darkroom. Um, it is a difficult process and I'm a perfectionist and I do not like when my stuff does not come out perfect. So this was for one of my finals for one of my classes and I kind of made it about this whole process of me failing because I felt I couldn't make anything successful. Um, so I like to incorporate like other found objects and stuff like this is like part of a roll of film. Um, I believe it's like 120 film so um, yeah and I love to incorporate like writing and stuff as well into my pieces because I feel like it really adds to the context and also explains my thought process a little bit better. And yeah, this is the last page of the book. It's kind of my favorite part because I always say, and I'm never happy with my with, in, with my work, but that's okay because I got this book out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's definitely like my favorite part of the book. And it kind of makes me emotional because I have spent so long worrying about getting a good product that I just needed to make one with all of my messed up work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also spent an entire semester doing tin types, which is uh, also known as wet plate collodion. Um, these are really difficult and also really toxic and not good for you. So you have to be wearing like full mask, safety goggles, gloves, like all of it when you're doing this stuff. And you also need to not do it too much at a time because you can, the fumes from the chemistry can make you pass out. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it is really intense, but it also is super rewarding. You get these really, really beautiful images. Tintypes are mostly like known for in like the West and stuff for like portraiture. Um, so this was um, a photograph I took um, in the Arizona desert. And I felt like it kind of fit the theme a little bit of tintype. So that's why I wanted to print it. Um, I do have, I did print more, but this was probably the most successful one that I made. So that's why I'm just showing this one. And um, this is also from the same uh, trip I did, but I, this was like my first kind of way of getting into digital photography. I always started out with film and alt process, so I never really tried digital photography unless it was something I needed for my other processes. Um, and yeah, I just really like experience, experimenting with uh, Photoshop, kind of messing with the colors and making them really bright or like just changing them completely. I really like to make sure that my images are unique and don't look like anything else that anyone else has made. Cause I feel like with digital photography, it's so difficult to make a unique image considering that it's so easily accessible to everyone with, you know, it's just on our phones. So I really try to make my stuff uh, unique yeah. to me. Yeah. And this is some color film. So I took a color film class um, spring semester of 2020. And as you can, as you guys know, um, uh, there was definitely a big, uh, event that, <laughs> that affected, um, me being able to continue this work. So this is the only print I have from color film. I only was able to develop one role, 
and print one image before my class went fully online and we went all digital. Um, it is really unfortunate because color film is a really, really beautiful, unique, um, it just has a really nice quality to it compared to like a digital picture. Um, and I wish I was able to do more, but I did make this print. Um, and yeah, I just, I was kind of doing, it was like the assignment was to shoot a roll at night. And so I, and it was really rainy and I was like, oh, this will look cool while I'm driving. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, yeah, so, uh, but I, next time I should be safer. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when the pandemic hit and we were all stuck at home, I decided for one of my final projects, I was gonna do a camera obscura, which is basically when you take, um, you can completely light proof either like a box or it could be a whole room like I did my entire bedroom, um, except for one tiny little hole of light that you let in and it projects the image of whatever is outside onto your camera obscura. Um, so this is in my bedroom. As you can see, I have tin foil covering my whole window. It was really dark. Um, these are long exposures, so it was not this bright in the room. Um, this is like maybe a 20 second exposure. So it was not this bright. It was like pitch black in my room for multiple days because it took me a long time to finish this project. Um, <laughs> I would probably never do it again in my bedroom at least. Uh, it was quite depressing, but I did get some really cool results. Um, and it was really cool to like see my backyard like projected onto my walls. So the, the one pinhole is through that one part of the foil. Yeah. Whoa, cool. So I put up like some white paper on my wall so that it could be seen a little bit better. But yeah, there's like trees and a power line pole and stuff like that that all got projected Did onto my walls. Did the color show up? I've never seen a camera up create. Yeah, the color, the color does show up. Project. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So then did you, how did you get the images? Was it, you put paper up, but it's what kind of paper? Um, this is just regular, like, uh, matte paper. Mm -hmm. um, you took pictures of it? Yeah, I took okay. pictures with my digital camera. Yeah, and, it and I- It was dark, it was like light enough for you to, or were they dark, really dark? It's really dark, so that's why I did the long exposures so that it would pick up all the light. So yeah, this is like not how it actually looked in my room. However, if your eyes adjust enough, then you could probably see the image, but it wouldn't be this bright. Were they like you said, like twenty seconds? Yeah, like twenty to thirty seconds, depending. Yeah. I have that photo. Did you cover a wall with photo paper and do a camera obscura? You probably could. Yeah, I think people have done stuff like that or similar to that. Um, it would take a lot of work though. Yeah. <laughs> and this was um this is when we were all like quarantined, so I was only I only had the stuff available to me at home, which is why I did this. So if you do it, do you get a positive or a negative? You get a positive. But it's well, upside down, right? Yeah, it's upside down. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess if you did it on photo paper, it would be a negative, technically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is some more recent work I've done. Uh, these are digital. I was in a class called digital compositing, which is basically just like learning and messing around with Photoshop. And so my teacher showed me this really cool way of like making these kaleidoscope kind of images. And it was really fun and a really cool way to like expand my knowledge on digital photography. Cause again, I don't like shooting just a straight picture and then just calling it a day. Like, I like to manipulate and edit them as much as I can to create, like, really cool results. So that's what I did with um, these images here. Yeah. And this is just more examples of that. So the one on the right here is inspired by Richard Moss. He's a photographer who shot infrared film, which basically creates like these bright and all the greens in your images turn into like fuchsia pink it's like really really cool I don't infrared film is like really rare to find and it's very expensive so I just did this in photoshop um but I kind of wanted to 
have like the same effect with mine and like creating like a really pink landscape that I thought would look really nice. And then this one is just um, a ton of images I combined of some with some construction. Um, and I kind of made it about like the fuel industry and um, and how there's so much development going on, um, especially in Phoenix where I'm from, like there's high rises being built like every year and it's a really insanely expensive and difficult uh, task that's done. Um, so I thought I would uh, photograph it and kind of talk about that. And that's why I have like those water ripples as well because this high rise specifically was being built right next to a lake that's mm -hmm. in Phoenix. And a lot of the beautiful views you get of the lake are kind of gone once those high rises come up. So I kind of wanted to show like the effect of that. Yeah. And then this is just another recent digital piece. Um, this is in Williams, Arizona, which is uh, near the Grand Canyon. Um, I got to go on a really great road trip with my friends and I took pictures of the Grand Canyon and they were just like, okay, here's some pictures of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> um, but when I was in the town of Williams, which is a really, really old Western town, it had all these really cool buildings and at night it was like kind of creepy and <laughs> yeah, I just really enjoyed, um, photographing the town itself more than really like, I mean, I enjoyed seeing the canyon, but like photographing it was just kind of basic. Yeah. And then this is my most recent digital project. Um, this was a self portrait. And this one on the left here is made with a scanner, actually. So I like put my hand on the scanner and I like moved it as the mm -hmm. scanner was moving. And then I just overlaid it with some textures and stuff I had from other scans. And then this one on the right uh, was playing around a lot with like the filters in Photoshop. And um, I photographed some really iridescent like jewelry I owned. And that's why like you get these like kind of rainbow iridescent effects. But yeah, I really wanted to like layer everything to make it look um, really cool. And what's the word? I don't know. Um, I guess just like really um, unique. I keep saying unique, but that's what I, that's what I'm always going for when I'm making my work. And then this was just another self portrait uh, from that series. You can see like the jewelry kind of better. It's like a big chain link mm -hmm. necklace that I had. And I also had some like glitter paper that I, that's like all the stars and stuff. I don't know if you can see it super well on the screen. Um, but yeah, I like, I just overlaid my images with other textures and stuff that I like to scan on my scanner um, or other photographs I've taken and just create like really cool textures and backgrounds and stuff like that. And I think that's my last one actually. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Have any pressing questions for like a minute or two and then we'll move mm -hmm. Do you have a dark room that you have access to? Like how do you I know you're in the dark room right now, mm -hmm. but how else do you find spaces to do this? Luckily, um I'm still in school, so I have access to my school dark room. I do have um, some darkroom equipment, but I don't really have the space in my house to <laughs> make a darkroom, unfortunately. So there are a couple um community uh darkroom labs though in the in the in the valley that I could probably get access to, but it would cost money. So yeah. People your shop. Oh yeah, and then <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow at Alchemy in the Dome, we're doing a pop up show. Me and Koza Ellis, who's another resident at Alchemy. Um, we're, I'm going to show all the work I've made, uh, here in the month I've been here and yeah, I'm going to have photographs. I'm going to have ceramics. I'm going to have printmaking stuff. It's going to be six to eight. You guys are all welcome to come. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thanks guys. So I'll take a class with Julius and uh, maybe Luna. Class.
We're just going to take a quick little break. And we will get going again with Sarah Hart in just a moment. Thanks so much for being here. how experimental you are and just keep experimenting all the time it's great um i'm a photographer and filmmaker and my work is uh documentary and it is um pretty much based on traditional photography and traditional film um i taught at rhode island school of design for 20 years and this allowed me to um uh, do some pretty great projects. Um, today, I brought work from a project that I did before um, I taught and before I went to grad school, which was actually launched my career. And um, I've never really talked to an audience about my work when many of the people who are in the photographs are also in the audience. <laughs> this is the first for me <laughs> and it feels really good. Um, I was very fortunate in that at the time I started photography when, uh, professionally, when I went to uh, grad school, there was still a lot of foundations that funded photographic projects. It was a time that is artists don't have the luxury of anymore. And so I was able to uh, write up projects and get them funded and then go. And because I was teaching, I had the summer off and I had six weeks off every winter. So I had the opportunity to go and do these projects. And there was sort of a, um, a circular uh, relationship between funding um, organizations and teaching. To teach, you have to publish or perish. And if you're a photographer, it means you have to produce work and projects. And funders know this. And at that time, uh, the photograph was still an important medium. I'm not sure it is anymore. And I mean, when I say photograph, I mean chemistry-based photography, not digital photography, which is actually very different. Um, so I, I kind of lucked out. My timing was just incredible. And I have to say thank you to the fishing community here in Friday Harbor because you guys are what launched it all. <laughs> um, and um, the difference between photography and chemistry based and digital photography is much greater than most of us think about. And my teaching started out being all um, chemistry based in the dark room. And by the time I retired, it was 100% digital. We had alternative processes and there still was a four by five class, but basically it was mostly digital. Um, and the photograph just become, became the subset from the stream of images from the videotape. Most ca uh, digital cameras will also um, take a fair, fair good amount of time of, um, of video. So the difference between the digital image and the video or film is just that the digital image is pulled from the stream. There's no longer what's called the decisive moment. It was a French photographer, uh, Cartier-Bresson, who um, wrote a lot about, thought a lot about how the, you have the decisive moment. That's when the shutter takes the picture. And this is a whole philosophy about the fact that there is a moment that's more important than other moments that has more meaning than other moments. And that's no longer true. It's just a flow. And of course, with the internet, we all have too much of a flow and too much access to stuff that really is mostly not very meaningful to our own individual lives. Um, but we can pluck out still what is interest, what is meaningful. Um, so, and talking about uh, the project with the fishing, I uh, had done my undergraduate work um, 
on the East Coast. And then I decided that I wanted to go to grad school to teach. And I have been doing a lot of photography um, all my life. My mother was a photographer. And I was working at the marine laboratories here in Friday Harbor, and I was doing a lot of photography for, for them. And um, I saw the opportunity to go out into this amazing landscape on the water and photograph uh, fishing. What I didn't know then, and none of us knew then, was it was the very end of the fishing as it had been known. Um, the University of Washington gave me a grant to go to work for two summers to photograph. Um, and But the, they didn't know, none of us knew that it was gonna be the end of the fishing as it had been um, really a main factor in this community for, I would say, I don't know how long, what, a couple generations, would you say? The fishing was really important for forever, I guess, from time immemorial. The tribes all fished here. <laughs> um, so it was um, pretty special. And I went on, uh, so anyway, I went back to the University of Washington to get my um, at BFA because I knew if I didn't have a bachelor's of fine arts, I wasn't gonna get into a good grad student um, school for uh, masters of fine arts. And uh, that's when I kind of got them interested in what I wanted to do. And they gave me the grant, which allowed me to do it. Um, and um, from there, I went to um, LA to graduate school at Cal Arts. And I went specifically to work with several professors who were there who did, digi who did documentary um, work. And what I'm interested in was spending a long time with a group of people to really learn in depth and look at something specific. Um, and I have a few pictures uh, from Russia that I take and I got a, um, a grant from the Lila Wallace Foundation. This was still in the days when people could get grants to work. And I got to go back to Russia over a period of four years as often as I wanted to. I had an open ticket on Delta and I had a multi-entrance multi uh, cultural visa. And the, my task was to photograph teenage girls. And um, I first went in 1992, which is a year after the Soviet Union um, failed. Um, and the idea was that I was going to photograph these young girls as they became Western, as they became just like Americans, as they became successful, as they had, um, teen culture was going to develop. And of course I got there and things got worse and worse and worse over the four years. And uh, I worked in a small town um, about 40 minutes Northwest of um, Moscow by train. And it had been a closed town. So there were, had been no foreigners there. Um, and so I was kind of an anomaly and everyone was, interested in opening up to the West. And so I was very welcomed. It was, it was as I say, just complete luck. I, I happened to be there at the right time. And I followed 15 girls through their four years of high school with them and their families to see what had happened to them. And as I say, times were very, very difficult. It was not easy. And that ended up being a fairly extensive uh, project. Um, the Lila Wallace Foundation was not happy with the results of my work because rather than showing what good little consumers they were all becoming, it showed how difficult times were for them. So um, the book that they were gonna publish never got published. Um, but at this point, about two years ago, I, it, I, it ran, the, it was enough time that now I can do something. Uh, with those images, but it's also a different time. And I don't think people are gonna be interested in this work anymore on that level because, and I'm um, sort of talking about Russia because it's the news right now. Um, it's, it's, things aren't good in Russia. Um, and I still have a lot of contact with my friends there. And having gone back over a period of four years and spent you know, quite a bit of time there um, during the, I, you know, I still have contact with people. I still, I, we email back and forth. Um, one of the 
a girl that I met when she was six years old and her parents are like very close friends of mine and she now lives in Brooklyn. And um, so when I get to talk to her a lot and uh, she talks to her parents and um, so that, but that kind of photography where you get a grant to go and do something over a period of multiple years basically doesn't exist anymore. Um, I, I've worked in Japan and I've worked, I did a lot of work in LA. I've also done a lot of work, um, sort of commercial work. Well, when I was in LA, I worked for uh, film companies where I had to go and photograph where they, where they were gonna shoot a film before they shot it. And then after it's all done, I had to go back and reshoot, um, rephotograph the place to see what damage they had done, which believe you me was extensive. <laughs> but I never knew what films, um, I was, and so sometimes I've been in films and I went, oh my God, you know, I, I, I know this place. <laughs> the Terminator was one of them. <laughs> the Terminator was shot in a defunct medical center um, near Pasadena. <laughs> um, so it's, and at this point, um, I'm not doing any photography. Um, because it's all based in computer and I have really bad carpal tunnel from too many years of teaching every day on the computer. And I was wearing braces on both hands for a long period of time. And I thought enough of that. So I actually um, decided I'd do something utterly analog. And I started painting, like you make a mark, you move your hand and you you see the mark of where your hand was. <laughs> and um, I'm still doing a little bit of filmmaking. I'm working with a uh, woman, um, Jessica Plum, who has her production company in Port Townsend. Um, it's almost, or it is entirely environmental film um, because that's that's really the only thing that interests me. Sorry, I keep, I have to, I have to remember that I'm talking to some virtual people here too. <laughs> so um, that's, I, the photographs that you see out here are work prints uh, for the most part. The ones, the Russian prints are final prints, but the fishing ones are work prints. When my house burned down in 1999, I lost all my prints. And I did have some work prints that had been separated out um, the only one that is not a work print is one of Lisa that happened to have been in an exhibition in China at the time. So that got saved. <laughs> um, and so a few prints that were out in exhibitions got saved. Um, and I thought my negatives had burned up, which was really, you know, that's, that's wow. really horrible. But what I found out last summer was that somehow they had ended up in my father's house he had died, people had packed up his house, my negatives got packed up with all his stuff, but I thought they had burned up in the house. Last summer, we unpacked the boxes from my dad's house and there were my negatives. Wow. And so that was an incredible gift, that was an incredible gift for me. So now I am going to um, scan them and digitize them and um, produce an exhibition. And for those of you, some of you sitting in the audience, you'll finally get those prints. <laughs> um, so have a look, um, ask any questions you want. And um, as I say, you know, I, I feel like I've been really fortunate in the timing of, of how things unfolded and being in the right place at the right time multiple times. Um, it, it couldn't have been better. Teaching at RISD was just fabulous. Um, the work in Russia was fabulous. The work in Indonesia was fabulous. You know, it's just like all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What type of camera were you using for this project? Well, I had a Leica was, a Leica was sort of, sort of like the phones are a part of our bodies now. My Leica was a part of my body for many, many years. It was just an extension. Uh, of me. And um, I had a Hasenblad for the ones that are square. And I had a Fuji six by seven for 
the ones that are sort of in between square and the 35 millimeter um, size. So yeah, you know, I use a lot of different cameras. Um, I'm curious about your painting practice and what do you use and what do you like about it? Well, it's utterly analog. It, to me, I find that fascinating and I'm fascinated by color and the fact that you can mix colors and you can make colors. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's almost just a gut level response I have to it. It's, it's, it, it's like cooking. It's like, oh, you know, I feel like a little ginger today, or I feel like a little this today, or I feel like that. And it's like with color, it's the same way. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Jim? Uh, so I just wanted to say, this that you chose fishing, I can't tell you how much it means to most of us who were fishing because it just came and went like a hundred other jobs on the island here. And it's so wonderful to see them and done so beautifully. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're a really cherished stuff. Well, you know, I, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them for two summers. I just, you know, yeah. went out and shot. And I hope that uh, I'm going to buy a good scanner so I can scan the negatives properly. And then I'm I think I'm probably going to hire someone to help me do it because I, you know, how many hours can you sit in front, you know, with a scanner and not right. lose your mind? Um, and so hopefully I'll have an exhibition. Well, it's, it's a great thing because it's, it's fun work. And we didn't know it was going to go yeah. away so quickly. Charlie was a piece of scanner. Was... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just another job to do, you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you do the film you did? How did I what? Do the film you did up the game. Oh well, when I was at um, when I was at RISD, I was teaching uh, video, which is film basically now. And um, then I, as I say, I just stopped. Uh, oh, hey, you want me to no, this is great because now I can do um, I can do everybody. Everyone can swivel. Um, <laughs> I, feel like I, was kind of I know you're kind of behind the wall. <laughs> this is better. Um, so I was um, Jessica Plum, who is a filmmaker in Fort Townsend, had the possibility of making this film about the Elwha Dam, and she had made many short films, and she was good, and she's a photographer also and an installation artist, but she had never done a long film. And so she knew that I had taught film at RISD and she knew that she needed someone to kind of, um, you know, help her. And so I, I say that my official position is I was mother hen <laughs> <laughs> and I helped her kind of do the budget and sort of, you know, figure out what needed to be done. And there were only three of us who did the film. It was an incredible effort. Uh, John Gustin, who's a very good photographer, shot most of the film for it. He had been shooting the film for several years before uh, we got together and started actually building the film. Um, and um, so that, that got me, that was my bridge between not working and not teaching at RISD. And then when I moved back out here, I immediately had something to do that was very engaging. And being over on the Olympic Peninsula, which I hadn't really known very well, was wonderful. And then the whole complex of uh, the economic, the political, the social, the environmental um, issues that come with taking a dam down, it was mm. really interesting. Um, <laughs> what is it called? Return of the Dam. I, th I, think it's on, I think it's on Amazon now. Um, okay. We have a, or it may be Return Netscape. The we have a, a, a river. Or we, I'm sorry, Return of the River. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> no, we moved on the dam. Return of the river. <laughs> Thank you. <Return. laughs> um, we have a distributor and they keep moving it around to wherever they can make the most money. And every time you watch it, we make 15 cents. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I yeah. So, other questions? Did you say you're working on another documentary with her now, or no? 
well, I just finished. We we do we do little tiny things for. I mean, we're hired all the time to do things. I've done we've done work for uh, Friends of the San Juan. Um, we've just been working on a commemorative piece about um, Ken Balcom. Um, you know, we do whatever comes up, but um, and we're thinking about doing another large film that's um, possibly in the works. But you know, getting the funding together is just really a lot of work, and we're working on that now. And I would say that may take a year just to get the funding together. And what's the topic of that documentary? Um, about the demise of the Salish Sea in terms of and using the orca as the indicator species. The idea that what's happening to the orca is ultimately happening to us also. But that's that's sort of the covert. Um, it'll be more about the plight of the orca. Hmm. But it will go into a lot of the uh, tribal um, myths about orcas. You know, and about how uh, the mythical level of them too, which is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. So you know, we have we have big ideas. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. Cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, should we go check out your photos and maybe ask well, some more? Yeah, I think questions people, in the mix. Well, people, yeah, we'll go over there, take a look. As I say, the um, ask questions. As I say, they're not. They're not just hundreds of them. Literally, there's thousands of them and all. <laughs> so but cool. these are the ones that, um, for one reason or another, happened to not be in my house when it burned down. Gosh, it's wild. Yeah, it was, fortunate to find out that they escaped. My negatives, the negatives escaped. Yes, because that was, I mean, That's that was big. Yeah, it was years, years. <laughs> Yeah, and I now understand why photographers um, keep their negatives in safes. Mm. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my. Let's keep it going. Let's look at photos. Yeah. <laughs> Now I want to now I have a I apparently just might be mixing up that. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Let's see what it looks like in the yeah. That's yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh my gosh, it's just so cool. <laughs> it's Lisa's dad, and that's her husband. <laughs> <laughs> so, the brain. That's so That's Lisa. Yeah, I know Lisa. Yeah. 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 The gaze. The gaze of the computer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is the second one. Yeah. 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 Yeah, stressful. I bet it was. I yeah. bet it was. Yeah. Well, it was a very small. Oh. Uh -huh. It was a uh, single person filmed. boat. We had three people. Yeah. Wow, they were built for people so going out by themselves. So there wasn't a lot of rest. Yeah. Here she's separating the scissors from the shock You know, the rods pulled out. Great. Yeah. 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 These are from the right. best right. Maybe you should stop watching. Oh, God. Yeah. No, you guys were tickets. Like, well, we did, you know, actually, um, one day we went out there under the fish yeah. and caught it. Uh, it was called the Rust Rider. So, 
and it came in and said, I don't it's like you get the whole thing to order the car, order the car. No, they were quite crazy. Yeah. 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 Oh, and they came in around the counter. They didn't have any I was like, what should I do? Yeah, it's hard thing. Yeah. It's hard when you're Thank you so much for joining.